You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hello again, and thanks very much for coming back to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by our very good friends at Trailtopia Adventure Foods. We've got a mix of a show today featuring a trail other than the Appalachian Trail as the main interview, while the AT is featured in If I Did It Again. Let me step back and explain. As many of you know, I read a chapter from a book, mainly my book so far, at the end of each episode. This allows me to build up an entire audiobook over a period of time. People seem to like it, so I intend to continue the practice. One of the issues I've run into over time has been the rights to actually read a book for the podcast. Of course, there were no issues with my own books, but the Earl Schaefer book, Walking with Spring, involved several phone conversations and loads of emails before I was finally given permission by whoever held the rights. Even that wasn't initially straightforward. Today is the last chapter of my own short third book, and I've been thinking of how to replace it for some time. I initially reached out to the author of a quite famous AT book a while ago, and since I didn't hear from him, I presumed my email had gone into the cyber vortex of his spam file. Well, it turns out that it didn't, and a couple of weeks back, I got a charming email and permission to go ahead. So, happy days. But in the meantime, I turned to an old buddy of mine who has had a really successful career as an author since leaving the UK as a teenager and living in Australia. He now writes under the name of Colin Falconer, but I knew him as Colin Bowles, or Bowlesy, when I first met him at school when we were both 11 years old. In case you're wondering why I'm reminiscing at this point, here's the bit about hiking. Colin and a friend, Elizabeth, or Ellie Best, hiked the Camino de Santiago in Spain in 2004. They were both embroiled in certain issues in their lives and both felt a need to go on this pilgrimage. They wrote a book about their journey, The Year We Seize the Day, and to cut a very long story short, this is the book I'm going to be reading from next week. I've also got some personal news about the Camino and maybe much more to share with you later. I'll return to that after the main guest. And our first guest today is the young lady, Ellie Best, who has an extraordinary story to tell. She's Australian and we spoke the other day. Ellie will be on shortly. In If I Did It Again We have the return of a fairly recent guest, Jeff Alt, who hiked the trail 20 years ago. Of course, there's plenty that Jeff would change, though he said something about his earlier hike that made me really smile. Jeff will be on after Ellie and my news. But before all of that, who's got a sweet tooth? If you have, this might just help. Do you remember those times on the trail when you really needed to treat yourself? You know, those days when you fall in the mud or the rain starts running down your neck, the rocks are driving you crazy, or even when you're just fed up. You need a boost. When that happens, stop hiking. Take off your pack and treat yourself to one of Trailtopia's scrumptious desserts. Why not go for a rocky road pudding? A rich chocolate pudding loaded with mini marshmallows and toasted slivered almonds. By the time you get that into your system, you're going to be warm, toasty and satisfied. Try Trailtopia Adventure Food. The best of home cooking away from home. So, let's hear from Ellie, all the way from the land of the kangaroos, Australia. Here's Ellie. Okay, I'd like to introduce you today to Ellie Best, or Elizabeth Best, as her father calls her, and the only person who calls her Elizabeth is her father. Hi, Ellie. How are you? Hi, Steve. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. And we're, we're on to talk about your journey on the Camino and the book that you wrote or co-wrote with my friend Colin. Um, I've been reading the first quarter of the book this morning, which is, you know, your parts of the first quarter. And the first big surprise for me, and one that I just did not remember from reading it the first time, is that you're an Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 totally forgot, I totally forgot about it. And my, my niece is reading your part, and she's from the west of London. I hope you don't mind. I was actually going to ask, is she going to take on the accent? <laughs> uh, no, 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 she's not. I'd like to hear that. 
Yeah, no, you wouldn't trust me. <laughs> it's a bit like what Americans. It's a bit like what Americans do with the English accent. They do the Dick Van Dyke version from Mary Poppins, and it never sounds quite right. Does no, it? no, no, it doesn't. It's funny. The the we did an audio version here in Australia, and the author, uh, sorry, the actress that took on my role, um, she was about twenty years older than me and had a slight English accent as well. And she kept <laughs> call, kept calling me up and saying, "Can you pronounce this again? Can you pronounce this again?" <laughs> I don't think oh, she quite yeah. got it. <laughs> Yeah, well, people have already heard me destroy the uh, American accent by reading a book by an American, so I'm sure they're used to this sort of thing, so they'll be okay with it. Now, I I love the idea of seeing the journey through two different sets of eyes, particularly because you and Colin weren't a couple in the mm. story, aren't, aren't a couple, obviously. There were no emotional intrusions to colour either side of the story. How did you write it? Was it completely independent or was it chapter by chapter? No, it was, well... The putting together of the book um, after the fact was chapter by chapter, but the the so we really wanted to keep this uh, this experience authentic, and we wanted to tell the story in a really authentic way. And so I think you know you probably know a little bit of background. I'm not sure if the listeners will, but um, Colin and I are complete polar opposites in every way. So. <laughs> Uh, he's very established in his career. I had at the time written one book. Um, he's yeah. a father with two daughters. I was a daughter with a, a father. Um, <laughs> he had some daughter <laughs> issues. I had some father issues. Um, we And we lived on opposite sides of Australia. So he was on the, the extreme west coast. I was on the extreme east coast. We met at a writers' festival. We connected straight away and we said, hey, one day let's work together. We left it at that. Two years later he calls up and says he's got two weeks free in his schedule. Let's go and do something. Thing. and we ended up on the Camino together so um it was it was a bizarre kind of set of circumstances but we thought the same thing we thought you know to tell the story of this this beautiful you know f- full of history um path this trail that has attracted millions from year on year from all over the world um to walk this same trail but to 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 um, to tell the two individual stories and in two individual t- interpretations of the same experience was was what we wanted to capture. So at the end of each walking day, we would go our separate ways. We wouldn't yeah. speak, um, and we would not come back until we had both written by hand three thousand words. Um, oh wow! And this wow. is this is in the day where you know. I think Cole had a mobile phone. I didn't even have that. So this was before um, smartphones. It was before, uh, you know, global internet access. So I think my family got three emails in the 33 days that we were away. But we <laughs> we tried really hard to keep everything that we were writing very, uh, very separate until until we put it all together later after the fact. So, so you literally didn't know what the other had written? Nothing. Um, no. That's in, well, I'll come back to that in a second. But mm-hmm. so every day you went away and did this, and yet it's clear that in the first few days, and I say I read a quarter of the book this morning mm. um, while I was preparing for this. It was clear in the first few days that there's so much more of Collins than yours. Why mm. was that? Yeah, I struggled. I really struggled physically. Um, so to give you an idea of my background at the time, so I was I was 27 when we. Um, when we set out on the Camino together. Um, yeah. When I was uh, sort of 19, 20, um, I suffered really severely with anorexia uh, to the point mm-hmm. where I went into, um, I had a heart attack. I lost uh, half of my own body weight. I lost my um, my hair and my hearing in one ear through malnutrition. I went into multiple organ failure and I almost died. So um, I was told at that point that uh, I would never have children. Um, that I would never live a normal life, that I would never f- work a full-time job, that my, there was so much internal damage done. Um, I had the bones of an 88-year-old woman um, at the time, Jeez. so early on, uh, early onset osteoporosis and all sorts of things. So um, I'd kind of been, you know, I'd been, I, I recovered mentally fine and, and really wanted to fight for my life back, but physically my body just never caught up. Um so I got to a point where I, I did, you know, live a really normal anorexia-free and, and still am, but um, a really normal life and thrived in a lot of aspects. But physically I just I still felt like a broken person and really never quite recovered from that experience. Um, 
So this was, the Camino for me was really a, it was a line in the sand and I, I was sick of feeling like a broken person. My aspirations kind of exceeded what my physical capabilities were and um, I needed a new evidence for myself. So I set this task for us randomly and on a whim and had no idea how my body was going to react. But um, wow. right up until a couple of days before, you know, I was still on um, an, an intravenous uh, a drip just trying to bulk up on vitamins, you know, and give my body as much as I could before I went. And mm. um, and I got out there and it didn't cope very well for the first few, few days. <laughs> what what <laughs> no a surprise. surprise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So I think I tried to train at one point. I mean, you know, what we achieved was nothing. It was probably a warm-up compared to what you've achieved, Steve, but um, no, not at all. I, I came from a position where I've never had health issues like that. Right, I mean, I, okay. I, 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 it, this now fills in a few gaps in my my reading this morning. You know, you you were sick for you let slept literally for twenty four hours, didn't you? Yeah, the second day, I think uh, I I woke up and I'd been vomiting all night, and um, Colin slept through it all. Colin's like this prolific sleeper. He's an, he's incredible, <laughs> and he tends to snore so loudly he keeps everybody else awake. So it's nice. Um, yeah, yeah, it's he's, <laughs> it's really interesting. But he got up that morning, and everybody had told him that uh, you know we're in a, a group kind of communal situation, and and everybody had told him that I'd been up all night vomiting and. Um, he kind of looked at me and he said, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I was trying to, you know, this was my evidence. I really needed this and I needed to prove to myself that I was capable. So I was willing to keep putting one foot ahead of the, the next, but I soon became severely dehydrated and started hallucinating and, um, oh. started and was walking backwards and just laughing hysterically and just really, you know, talking about catching trams to St Kilda and getting in the next round and, I just really lost lost my way a little bit. Um, wow. So we wow. found some some nurses who kind of laid me down straight. I collapsed at one point and some nurses came along, some Irish nurses, and rehydrated me and um, gave me their, you know, their re- rehydration fluid and sort of got me as far as the next town. Um, and a priest took one look at me and wrapped me in blankets and put me to bed Colin at this point thought it would be a great idea to go and spend the day in Pamplona at San Fermin at the, <laughs> the running of the bulls rub festival the, rub the bulls, yeah. yeah it just kind of left me there thinking that I would yeah. be fine sleeping yeah. and you know <laughs> unconscious with this priest and and he came back and you know it was the next morning and around lunchtime um when I woke up and I hadn't, yeah, I was completely disorientated. I had no idea what day it was or how long I'd been sleeping. And so a whole wave of pilgrims had come into the, the, the room where I was sleeping and unpacked and showered and talked amongst themselves and cooked a meal and, and laid down and slept and got up and got ready and gone the next day. And I just completely missed the whole thing. So that was day two. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it wasn't wasn't the most propitious start there, was it really? No, no. (laughs) Funny enough, you know, that really now I understand a line that I'm going to quote right back to you mm-hmm. and ask you a question about it. Okay. A line that I read, and it really, really struck me, and I thought, particularly as you wrote this about 14 years ago, because this is when you actually wrote it, doing the hike mm-hmm. in 2004. Mm-hmm. It says, I wonder whether this relentless quest to challenge myself, to break down walls, mm-hmm. to walk across countries, to, to be more than I already am, might be fueled by fear, fear of not being enough or perhaps fear of being too much like everybody else. That mm. seems so resonant for today, and yet mm. you wrote it though, 14 years ago. And I was thinking more in terms of as a woman, but this is more the challenges you were facing, I presume, wasn't it? Yeah, it's kind of, I think, yeah, I think I've always had this um, unrealistic, uh, unfair um, pressure that's purely my own to yeah. achieve um, great things, you know, globally, not just, you know, I played sport nationally and I, I, I just, it wasn't enough. I wanted to be the youngest, you know, and I wanted to be the youngest to, to do anything that I've ever achieved. And it was just this relentless drive to always be something more than just average. And I don't, I don't know if it, you know, I had high achieving parents. I don't know if it came from there. It certainly wasn't imposed on me, but um, there, yeah, there came a point, I think, where I realised um, around that day two mark, um, you know, I went outside once I, I, I finally came to and I was in, again, an empty 
kind of in a hostel because everyone had already left for the day and no one else was coming in until 3 p.m. I, I walked out into the garden and it was just me and it was a, a high stone wall kind of closed gar- garden and there was me and a tree and two cats and I took some time and I kind of meditated and I did some yoga and I thought about, you know, where I was at and why this could have ha- been happening on the second day, you know, what's the lesson here and and I came to the realisation that, um, that this is that this is my quest, you know, and it could have taken me, you know, at 21 it took me to the Middle East by myself as a single white woman, um, yeah. you know, and here at 27 it's brought me to the Camino and, and, you know, when will it be enough and is it enough and is it really relevant, you know? Yeah. Do, do you recognise that woman now? Which one? The one who wrote that. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, do you still I, have the? Do you still feel the same sometimes? I do. Yeah, I've got a lot of, um, I've got a lot more restrictions and responsibilities on me these days, though. So sometimes that urge has got to be set aside for the sake of of other people. But um, yeah, I think I think making peace with that has, um, has been really the making of the last kind of ten years of my life. And um, the, the more peace that I make with that side of me, you know, that competitive fueling of trying to prove myself constantly to be, you know, more than average and, and, and you know, extraordinary on some level, you know, the, the more I can accept myself as not that, um, the, more, sure. the, the more quality of life I have and the more peace I have within myself. So, yeah, it's been a real learning. Were you actually a walker at the time, though? I mean, I wasn't, this is no. Wow, no. what? So what was it within you that made you want to take on not just to walk 20 miles? Why, why did you want to walk 500 miles? What was it? Was it and was it a spiritual journey for you? You know, what is it? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So um, so the, the really short answer is that uh, Cole called me at uh, Colin, who I wrote the book with, called at, at 11 p.m. one night. It was random. Oh. I hadn't heard from him in many, many months. And he called and he literally said, uh, I have a couple of weeks free in my schedule. We should write a book together. Is there anything that you really want to do and that you've always wanted to do? And I said, well, I've always wanted to build a school in Africa. And he said, that's going to take more than two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> True. And, I, and I said, okay, so uh, I guess I've always wanted to walk a pilgrimage, but, you know, I, get, I figured that would be later in life. And he said, which one? And so I Googled. I Googled pilgrimage and up came the Camino de Santiago. Um, oh. So we we were literally there within 10 days um, from that conversation. Um, and I think I explained in the beginning of the book, I can't quite recall it probably as well as you, given that you read it this morning, but um, <laughs> it was just, it was always something I wanted to do, not... Um, not for the sake of the the walking or the challenge, but for the sake of being the kind of person that would take that time and that would sentence themselves to that for the sake of introspection and, and betterment, you know. So um, so anyway, for whatever reason, we ended up out there. <laughs> Interesting choice of word, by the way, sentence themselves to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's what it was, you know, back in the, the medieval days. It was, you know, it was they, they would give somebody um, jail time or they would sentence them to the Camino. So you yes. know, it was yeah. very much a sentence. Um, but it, but it was, there was a purpose behind it that was, I, I felt like was really worthy for me that I really needed. And so that hadn't been, that need hadn't dissipated with the 24 hours of sleep. And no. cause I know that Colin, Colin was already planning the route back home, wasn't he? he? Yeah, he was. He didn't tell me that at the time though, which was interesting. That only came out in the book. I learned that through, through reading his chapter for the, for the book, um, he didn't let on, and I think when when he came back from San Fermin, and I, I came, you know, I'd, I'd made peace with what had happened, and I'd made peace with myself, and I realised what I needed to do, and you know, I'd set myself this mantra, and I, you know, I was determined that this was, you know, I needed this challenge in order to really fortify my, you know, my purpose here on the Camino. And he came back from San Fermin, and before he said a word, I just said to him, you know, I need you to believe in me. And right. that way, when I doubt myself, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to you and you're going to convince me that I can do it. And even if you doubt me, you need to, you need to not let me see that, you know, like you're right. going to be my rock and we're going to get there, but you need to believe in me. Well, you reciprocated that belief 
well, about a quarter of the way through the book, which is a bit I've just read. <laughs> Isn't it funny how times, do, yeah, everything turns over. <laughs> it, it, re, it really is. And I was wondering, and come, I'm going to come back to the hike in a minute, but I'm mm. still fascinated by the writing of the book. So when, when you, did either of you have veto power over what the other one wrote or was it entirely separate? I think we gave each other, um, we gave each other a couple of vetoes. Um, not much because I think Col and I are both by nature self-deprecating. So I think we're okay with most stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he he asked me to remove a reference, I believe, to his daughter. And I asked him to remove a reference to my father. So oh, right. that was personally, uh, sorry, purely through, um, you know, through our personal relationships. Um yeah, so it, that was that was it though. Apart from that, the rest is raw and um, yes, it is and honest. Yeah, really honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a little bit too much for, on Colin's side. Oh my gosh! Oh um, well, uh, yeah, yeah. I think, on, I think on both sides. But I think I think later on, you know, after the book was published and now, given that some time has passed, I think I think the level of honesty that Cole wrote that story is what makes him most proud of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because as you say, he's written fifty books, and and you've yeah. actually now, because at the time you just published one book, according to Wikipedia, which may be wrong, of course, and it may be, <laughs> it is, <laughs> may, may have improved. It said that's written to thirty one books. So yeah. I was going to ask how your a writing career developed after this, but obviously quite well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not actually accurate. <laughs> um, so right. there's a there's another Australian yeah, author. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's another Australian author um, whose name is Elizabeth Best, who I believe is in her 80s, um, mm. who had a career in children's books and who kindly, after my first book was released, and it, it did really well, it became a bestseller in, in the first few weeks that it was released, and she wrote me a hand letter, handwritten letter um, to kindly ask me to change my name because she had been publishing under it for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, the powers yeah. that be at Wikipedia have somehow gelled our two personalities together. Yeah. Well, look, we're going to talk about, obviously, as we're reading the book, I don't want to give the story away too much, but give us a, some flavour of the book. Let's talk about the journey and how you got into it because because you were both struggling, and he was struggling as well from the start. W- was there a point that you realised you were going to get there or was your just your determination there right from that day you recovered after the 24-hour sleep? I don't think we were ever not going to get there, no. There was, even from the day we landed, I think um, we had to take, so we, we ended up, we caught a train to Pamplona uh, from Lourdes, which was another incredible experience, um, Lourdes in France with the holy water and yeah. uh, we started the journey there actually and uh, we wrote some articles from for some Australian uh, newspapers um, out of there we weren't sure whether we were going to incorporate you know the search for miracles into the into the book uh, and as it happens it got dropped but um, mm. but we caught a train to Pamplona and and from Pamplona we had to catch a bus back into um, toward the French um, border uh, and over that time period, we passed, you know, the trail that we would be walking down um, for the next couple of days, two to three days. And it was it was in seeing it through a bus window that I panicked. Um, so there was probably a little bit of doubt at the beginning, but once that once that second day passed, and I came out of that, you know, that um, dehydrated kind of awful state. Um, <laughs> I don't think there is any way we weren't going to make it one way or another to Santiago. It was just a matter of how long it was going to take. Really? You, yeah. So did you feel the sickness again or did after that did you – was that the worst – in other words, was, was that the worst you were sick? So I'm only a quarter of the way through this time. And I don't – I read the book as soon as it came out because obviously Colin was a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, so uh, so I, I don't know – I can't recall how it ended for you. Did you get sick again? Yeah, no, I didn't get sick at all um, after that, but I, I got really injured. But I, but I, but again, you know, it, it, there, there was no way I wasn't getting to Santiago. So I think, I think from Cole's perspective, you know, he comments a lot on my injuries because for him, I was like a leper walking toward the finish line in the end. You know, <laughs> um, I think I think the last chapter is actually called "Leper in Lace." Um, because I, <laughs> I made a point to wear lace underwear and paint my toenails and I looked hideous for the rest of the way. <laughs> um, 
but mm-hmm. but no, it was you know injuries were my thing, and and Cole's um, so m- my thing was very physical. You know, my body was obviously protesting about me doing this. It wasn't ready. It was you know it was used to being sick and unwell and weak, and I was um, demanding it not to be that way. So I was always going to have conflict in that respect, but. Uh, Cole's, Cole's battles were purely mental, emotional, and yeah. um, and I'm not sure which was more. Uh, it, well, actually, I am sure. I think Cole's were was much more debilitating than mine, and and certainly long lasting. Um, so it was interesting that we went, we embarked on this journey for Cole to be my rock. You know, he was physically yes. fit. He was, um, you know, as a writer, he was really experienced, and he was really yeah. going to just guide this troop to where we needed to go and and the roles really did reverse I think about a third of the way through um which you know in retrospect was was great for me because I really needed to prove something to myself um to not only make it but to also support him through um but at the time it, it was really hard it was really hard how how did you assume that role because if you were having your own issues with that that quote I read to you which was, mm. you know, was quite a powerful quote how did you feel about taking on the role of almost responsibility of him part way through yeah it was hard I had to balance a little bit I guess I had to balance you know my own needs um and what it was I needed to take from the journey with um with also you know I'm an incredibly empathetic person and I'm I'm also the sort of person where if you know, if you're in a well, I won't try and pull you out. I'll just jump in with you. You know, we can work out a way together. <laughs> so I had to be aware. I love that thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to I had to be aware of that and um and support him as much as I could. But also the 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 demons that he were bat- he was battling were just was so big. They were so big and yeah. and you know any support I could provide him was never going to be enough. And the, you know, finishing the Camino was not going to be enough. You know, Cole would need, he would need a lot of time and, um, and possibly some therapy, but you know, a lot of support to, to get past yeah. that stuff. So, you know, I did what I could and I, 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 I cared for him. I still care for him. I was on the phone to him yesterday. Um, it was mm-hmm. his birthday on Sunday. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I still have a lot of love for Cole. He read at my wedding recently, which was amazing. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, I really needed, if I was going to make it, you know, I'd come to Spain, you know, pretty much the other side of the world to really prove something to myself. So I kind of needed to stay true to that at the same time. So once you got into the rhythm of the hike then and you were mm-hmm. you were moving along and the roles were reversing, there's still that physical work that has to be done every single day. And mm-hmm. we've talked about the rhythm of the hike on one or two of our recent hiking shows as well. Yeah. Um, did you did you feel that rhythm within you? You know, that, the oh, way yeah. you said, is that a great feeling? And, and Yeah, yeah. And, and how did that manifest itself? Yeah, it was it was great to get to a point where um, we would get to the, to a town, and the, so we walked in a Jacobin year, which um, which is a holy year. So the trail has you know many 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 times more uh, hikers on it than they usually would. So uh, we knew nothing about this because we left with two weeks notice so <laughs> we were very naive to that fact but <laughs> we would walk to the town and we would get there and we'd we'd have done you know 25 k's and i'm sorry but you're gonna to have to translate that into miles yeah for kilometers me, everybody yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's about uh 12 it's about 60 percent of uh, it's about 15 18 15 16 miles Okay, so we would we would go that far, and we would think, "Wow, that's you know a crazy day." But hey, this looks like a nice place to stay. Let's stop. And there would be no beds in the whole town because of all of the people on the trail. So we'd say, eh, "Let's go another twelve k's," you know, and then we'd do that, and then there would be no beds. And we're like, "Ah, oh, let's knock out another ten and go to the next town," you know. And there was this right. time where I think we looked at each other, and it was just past Villafranca. Um, so we'd come down through the mountains, and it, everything was misty and dusty, and it was just really beautiful and lush and green and we just walked we spent a whole few days just walking and walking and walking until we found a town and we were doing 40k you know plus days at that time and just thinking you know it was the first time we looked at each other and said hey we we've got this like this is you know the physical element is conquered for us we're fit we're strong we know how to do this now you know it it probably, probably took us about halfway to actually get fit enough to you know, to yeah. walk those, yeah. those bigger days. And then and yeah. then the challenge became completely about something else, which was the fact that there were no beds left anywhere. 
So we that up, was back, you know, in 2000, uh, challenges. back in 2004. Wow. Yeah, so challenges of a whole other kind. Like we ended up sleeping in like in garden beds and in bar- people's barbecue pits in their backyards and <laughs> we slept in a stairwell of a disused building at one point. We were literally homeless uh, for the last week or so of the Camino. <laughs> did, the, yeah. did the physical side of things help with your your personal mental not mental issues you know what I mean but did, did the physical side enhance the mental side for you yeah the, har- you? the harder it was the stronger I felt mentally yeah. because I yeah. knew I knew I was proving like with every step as as painful and as difficult and as challenging as it was and, and I think that was my mantra that I wrote on that second day um in the courtyard before we started again my mantra was every step is making me stronger within and without and I just knew yeah. that um Every step I was taking was making me mentally stronger, but it was also making me physically stronger. So, um, yeah, the tougher it got, the better I the better I liked it. Now I know this is this is a pilgrimage that ends. I think it's is it you touch the statue in Compostela, uh, Santiago? Yeah. So there's the yeah. So inside the church, um, uh, there is the statue of Saint James, uh, and uh-huh. they hold a pilgrims' mass each day for pilgrims who uh-huh. have arrived. Um, and we we continued on to Finisterre as well. Um, oh, right. That was cool, really yeah. Imp- yeah. It was really important to Colin, and and I thought it would just be a really fitting uh, ending uh, for the book and for our journey to actually go to the end of the earth. You know, the place that yes. was considered um, the last place of Earth before you know, right. the ocean ended, um, and to actually leave something behind there before starting again, which is the tradition. So the the original t- tradition of uh, the Camino was to walk to Finisterre and um, and leave your belongings and then walk back new. So, uh, right. yeah, I really liked something about, given the nature and what the Camino had come to mean for me, I, I really liked the idea of going to the end and, and making some promises to myself and just leaving them there and walking, about, and walking back again. So the last step for you was at Finisterre and then you, so the, you didn't get the feeling of it's over at uh, the Statue of St. James, you've got the feeling it was over at the end. How did that feel? Steve, I don't think it ever really finished. I don't think that was the finish at all. It never <laughs> felt like it was over. No, it felt like the, the, the Camino really felt like the beginning of something for me. Um, and I, I think Colin shares this as well. We've spoken a lot about it over the years. Um, but it really felt like the beginning of something. I don't think the Camino ever really ended um, for me. I, I, it, no. no, I think it was just You're, the beginning. Yeah. Did it? Uh, it's interesting. So, were you one and done though? In terms of, was there another longer hike, or did it encourage you to do other longer hikes, or was this such a transformative experience for you that that was sufficient for you to continue it effectively in other ways? Well, both, I suppose. So, the first first thing that happened was, um, first thing that happened was it, it proved it was the line in, in the sand for me. So, it proved to me that. Physically, I was capable of anything, um, anything I set my mind to, and it also proved to me that my mind was much stronger than uh, my physical capabilities, and that I could use one to, you know, to better the other. So that was given, you know, my background and my previous illness, and you know, the damage that was done. I felt like it was almost evident, the evidence that I needed um, to go and really thrive, thrive in my own life. So, so in one, it, it, on one hand, I guess you know one was enough I got what I needed but at the same time it made me fall in love with walking to the point where I never stopped walking so right. um I, I would call myself uh up until uh up until my son was born a couple of years ago uh I would call myself uh an urban hiker so uh every weekend you know I work a normal working week and then every weekend I would put a pack on my back and a bottle of water and I would walk out of my front door on foot and we're really lucky we live um, we live in the, the hinterland on the Sunshine Coast of Australia, so I'm in mm-hmm. rainforest. Um, nice. But I would walk primarily straight to the ocean and I would, you know, kick along the cliff faces of the, the rocks there for a few hours and then, you know, perhaps stop at a cafe and grab a bite or a drink and then just keep going. And I would come, I would walk back in my front door at dusk, you know, and that yeah. was that was every weekend and it wasn't. Was that, was that a solitude thing though? Was that a solitude well, thing? Or was, was that, or was that still the Camino? We, I think it was freedom. 
you know, and I think that's what I found in the Camino. I found a real freedom not only in walking, at connecting with your environment, at being one with nature, those kind of things, but I think um, I think the freedom of being self-sufficient um, and self-sustaining, you know, that you can provide for yourself, that you can get yourself to where you need to be. That I mean, the, you know, the Camino and I'm sure other hikes also really reduced for the first time in my life every day down to four key elements, which were food, water, health and shelter. You know, yes, if, if something absolutely. went wrong with your health, um, you know, you're in trouble. If you didn't find shelter, you're in trouble. If you didn't find food or if you run out of water, you're in trouble. So every day, you know, you're walking and you're getting from A to B, but they're your key priorities and they're the only priorities. And there's such a beautiful freedom in that and a simplicity and a purity that I really fell in love with. And I think, sure. I think every weekend from the Camino right through until when my son was born was all about recreating that and revisiting that place and really connecting back into that place. Well, I, I guess from what you just said that my last question is somewhat redundant. It says, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're old and grey, how will you look back at the Camino? Because it sounds like it was the transformative moment of your life. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I've had a few, I, I think. Um, so I think the, the day that I got up um, from – a hospital gurney in an emergency room having suffered a heart attack and said, it's okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to reclaim my life in some way I'm going to live. Mm. So I, I actually it. took the cardiac monitor off my chest and the um, and the drip out of my arm and I walked myself out of hospital and, and I said, you know, if these guys can't do it, I'm going to do it myself. And I uh, gathered a team and I researched, I read medical journals and I did what I needed to do and I, I put all the pieces together and within about you know, two or three years, I had myself back together and back on track. So I think that was probably the first transformation that I experienced as far as really taking life into your own hands. Um, yeah. I think to to make that, um, in order for that to really reach its full potential, I needed some evidence that I was physically capable. And I really think that's what the Camino was for me. It was the evidence I needed Um to move into my life with strength yeah. and power and, and, you know, and, and, um, and some sort of certainty about what I, what it was I wanted to achieve. And then I think, you know, I really think the last few years of my life have been equally transformative. You know, I, I was told that I would never have kids. I was told I'd never live a normal life or work a full-time job. I now, I now have two kids, two beautiful yes. children. So I've got a, <laughs> a one-year-old little girl and I've got a three-year-old little boy and um, and my life is just very much revolved around them and, and their upbringing and, and, you know, trying to instill lessons and morals and values into them every day. And, you know, I think that's equally transforming. It is transformative in a whole other way. But, um, but yeah, the, the Camino definitely was a key element to that equation for me. Well, it's all part of a path, isn't it? We're all on a path oh. somewhere, somewhere or other, and yeah. uh, and I think the Camino means the way or the path or something like that. Mm. So that was that was a significant part of your, part of your your life, and it's made some some difference to you. And I think that those things are very instructive for everybody who ever thinks about it, testing themselves in the way you did. And going, just going and doing it, and I, I, I admire you for it. And I'm sure the listeners are going to love listening to your story, because I mean, I, I, and I know Colin from a from the age of eleven, age of eleven years of age. So you know, mm. I know what he was like. So it's been lovely to meet you as well. And uh, I, I thanks so much for sharing this with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Steve, and thank you so much for sharing our book with your your listeners. It's um, like I said, it's it's a real. Uh, it's got a really special place for Colin and I. So, um, yeah, oh, we love cool. we love hearing that people are going to connect with it. That's great. All right. Well, I hope we will speak again soon. Right. Yeah. Take care, Steve. Thanks again. Cheers then. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> She's an Aussie. That was indeed my first big surprise. I'd originally read the book, and probably because I was reading mainly my friend Colin's words, I couldn't have registered that she was Australian. As I said, my niece Laura, who is definitely not an Australian, will be reading Ellie's part. Oh well, you just have to imagine she's an Aussie. I get mistaken for one all the time, so it isn't too much of a stretch. Wasn't that quite a story from Ellie, though? She had a heart attack as a young woman, an organ breakdown from anorexia. But even after that, she wouldn't let even those kicks in the teeth stop her from achieving her goals. What a woman. I seem to say that a lot on this show. The women I've interviewed have all been extraordinary in their own way, as indeed have the men, 
but it's the spirit of the women that always sticks in my mind. I also found her and Colin's writing processes to be compelling. We're going to get the same story from two different perspectives. I really hope you're going to enjoy it. Now, I want to share some news with you. I'm mentioning this now because I've already vaguely mentioned it to one or two of you in passing. As many of you know, I now have four podcasts. There's this one, Mighty Blue. There's Returning to Katahdin with Bruce Matson. There's the lovely Anna Huthmaker and her trail dames. And last, but by no means least, there's Dixie Live on the CDT with the charming Jessica Mills. The thing with two of these shows, RTK and Dixie, there's a limited time during which I need to work on them. Basically, both of these should be over before the middle or end of September. Do you recall several weeks ago when I reached out to you all and asked you to suggest possible replacements for RTK for the class of 2019? Well, I've had some responses, and I'll get to that in a moment. But what I've discovered after failing twice at the John Muir Trail and developing a pulmonary embolism in my lung is I really want to go out and hike again. But I also want to continue the Mighty Blue podcast in some form or other. So this is my current plan. In early October, I intend to hike the Camino de Santiago. You see, it wasn't a complete coincidence to have Ellie on the show today. I'll be going with my lovely niece, Emma, and podcasting directly from the trail using my iPad or even just my iPhone. I'm working hard at exactly how I'm going to achieve this, and I must tell you that there is one huge caveat. My wife and I are selling our current home and moving to Venice in Florida, just about 40 miles away. If we don't sell, I won't be going. But presuming it all works out, the Camino is my goal, but then it gets better. If, and I know it is a big if, if I can drag this 65-year-old body along 500 miles of the Camino, I think I'm going to be ready to celebrate my five-year anniversary of hiking the Appalachian Trail by joining the class of 2019 and doing it all over again. As you age, you feel the window of opportunity start to creep closed, and so I want to make this one last attempt. The great thing will be that the Camino will establish the proof, to me at least, that I can do this, and I'll also be able to live podcast from the trail. So the show won't close down, we'll give you your regular AT fix, and I'll be living the dream once more. What do you think of that? Moving on now, let's hear from Jeff Alt in If I Hit It Again. Listen to Jeff's first answer to my question about what he might change from his hike. I think he nails it, really. Here's Jeff. Okay, we're back on with Jeff Alt, who was, I guess, oh, several episodes back now, and he did the trail about 20 years ago. Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm good. Uh, great to be back. Thanks. Nice, nice talking to you again. And uh, you know what this is about? This is about... Um, and, and I'm sure you would have done things a whole lot differently because this is 20 years on since you did it and before the arrival of technology to the trail. How do you think you're, if you were doing this for the first time, hiking the Appalachian Trail for the first time, um, what would you do differently from your experience the first time? Well, first, I, I don't have buyer's remorse from the first time because it, it was a life-altering adventure. So from that regard, I mean, I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed my adventure. That yeah. being said, as you've noted, the, the technology of gear, um, of communication has uh, improved immensely. So that really ups the ante of what I would do different. Um, so gear, like everything that I hike with now is way less weight than what I carried 20 years ago. My pack is literally 20 to 25 pounds lighter. Oh, uh, really? Do you, do, you, yeah. do you take? But you, do you take less stuff? I think you learn how to live with less, don't you? As well. Uh, you know, I don't think it's really less less um, uh, stuff. It's it, it's each item has lightened up so much. I, I did this comparison article um, looking at a lightweight hiker versus the gear I had 20 years ago, and it was, was blew my mind at, at the difference in weight. But from, like, the jacket I, I wore back then was two pounds. My jacket now is two ounces. My stove wow. was two pounds. My stove now is, is like, less than uh, two ounces. My my. My I wore the heavy leather boots then, and so you're picking up about a pound of boot with each step. Now I'm wearing yeah. these these lightweight 
uh, trail shoes. I still have the Vibram sole on them, but just everything in general. But um, the one thing, I guess, I, the communication, like I, I used slide film, the old roll film that you mailed right. home. Yes. <laughs> I, the, the, now I would probably do a lot of video. I would, um, you know, do an uplink once a week and FaceTime or do live Facebook video, things like that to be more interactive with people who are following along and just so I could share my adventure more interactively. Yeah. I must say that I've been watching a number of videos, uh, especially this year. There's a, there's a family on the trail of eight people, uh, mother, father, and six kids. And the fact yeah. that they are able not only to keep their kids healthy, but they're able to upload a video every single day they're on the trail. It is extraordinary the ability for people to be able to do this as on the fly, really, isn't it? Oh, and those those videos will be so memorable. It, and, totally. and on that same note, I would involve my children, which I didn't have 20 years ago. Oh, so right, whether they yeah. wanted to hike a section or walk with me, the, they would definitely be at a um, you know a resupply stop in a town or hiking with me for a section or the whole thing. So I would definitely make it a, a very family friendly hike. Um, as far as um, Weather goes. I was uh, um, hardened and a little more stubborn back then as far as dealing with cold weather. Um, yeah. And most of the people I hiked with quit because of the extreme sub-freezing temperatures. And when did, you, when did you start, Jeff? March 1st, which isn't, by today's standard, isn't all that much of a jump. But back then, most people waited till April. Yeah. But the, a, a snowstorm hit, and it was a... They they were doing rescues to pull people out of, out of the snow wow. conditions, and I would probably have, have just uh, I would have stayed in a town along the way and taken some time off, maybe helped out at an outfitter or something like that. Um, and then about those blisters, if I could go back and prevent those from ever <laughs> occurring, <laughs> uh, it, you know, you can go. Back. I had put the arch supports in the wrong boots uh, on the first That's day, right. and. <laughs> So I, I earned my name Wrongfoot from my yeah. error yeah. on day one of my original hike. As far as some of the, uh, the animal encounters, you know, in retrospect, it wasn't so bad um, sharing my sleeping bag with a skunk looking back on it. So if that happened again, I'd be okay with it. But I could deal with do without the, um, the bull up in New York. I, I don't want to ever encounter a bull chasing me ever again. So that would <laughs> definitely be something I would try to avoid. But I think um, what you said early on was really important. You know, you you said about it being, you, you almost, you want to take the blessings because of the good and the bad, really, don't you? Of the hike that happened to you. And, you know, any any slight change you may have made to it may have altered the outcome of that hike in, in exponentially. So I, I like that idea, the fact that, you know, you can see you would do things differently if you're approaching it differently, but you, you absolutely want to preserve the, the integrity of that hike, if you know what I mean. Oh, no doubt. And it's funny now because I'm writing this children's outdoor series, um, yeah. na national park series, and they time travel back to learn about the past. And, and one of the rules is to not, not alter or interact with people you meet in the past be, so you don't mess up history. So yes, yes. in the same regard with my hike, you know, some of the the – the mishaps of my blisters, for example, or yeah. being chased by the bull, um, were actually some of the funnier anecdotes to laugh about afterwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you talk, when you talk to children, and you do you ever show them, or do you still have the pack that you took with you? Do you ever talk about the weight that you were carrying at all? That you know, the weight doesn't come up too much. But so when I talk talk to kids about hiking, I go over the basics of what you should have in your adventure pack when you're going with your family. Um, you yeah. know, so I hit on the basics of, um, you know, the 10 essentials and, um, the, your water and food and non cotton yeah. clothing and, um, you know, m making it fun and going at the pace of the slowest hiker. So everyone's included and you don't yeah. leave people in your dust. Please forgive my ignorance here. Was non cotton clothing a thing 20 years ago? It, it was. Yeah. Um, it, now the technology wasn't where it's at now, so it was, um, you know, I was using some of my clothing was athletic apparel, 
Right, uh, it, right. It, you, you're, it did transform. I mean, gosh, back then, just prior to that, even the military still used cotton BDU uniforms, which is, right. you know, they've come, well, they, they had just transitioned over, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, from, I mean, so that, that era was still there, you know, and if, yeah. if you look back at some of the pictures from, um, like the eighties there, there's hikers wearing blue jeans, hiking the trail. So <laughs> I, it, I saw a guy in blue jeans when I was hiking the trail for about one day. <laughs> we never saw him again. Uh, I think he yeah. realized he, he, I think he realized he made a bit of a mistake in those. Yeah. And so I, I just, I think, um, you know, I think, I think the general public now is more informed about, um, layered clothing. I think it's become yes. more, I think the Appalachian Trail has become more mainstream than it was then. I mean, more people are doing it now. Um, I attribute that to the lighter gear. I attribute that to um, the, the domestic hostels along the way. They're, they're more abundant now. Um, gosh, you know, back then, trail magic was really like, wow, I can't believe this <laughs> happened to me. Where nowadays, <laughs> like, I, I was driving back from Florida on spring break, and I stopped um, at one of the gaps down near Helen, Georgia, uh, yeah. uh, you know, north of Neal's Gap, to hand out Easter eggs. It was an Easter Sunday. And I thought, <laughs> oh, these hikers will really get a kick out of this. And there were three tables set up at this, this parking lot and giving trail magic. So that didn't happen 20 years ago. Like it I'm was sure. far and few between. Now it's pretty yes, common. Well, as, as you mentioned that, um, it's funny enough, I, we've got a, 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 another show we have called Returning to Guitar, and we talked about trail magic the other day and the and the true serendipity of trail magic. And, and for me, trail magic is not a hiker feed. Trail magic are those seemingly impossible things, those seemingly coincidental things that just occur when you need them. That, to me, was always trail magic. I mean, I, yes. I loved don't, don't get me wrong. If I found a cool box with the Snickers and some Powerade, happy days as far as I was concerned. But that, right. to me, wasn't really trail magic. Trail magic were those incredible things that would happen to you. You just cannot explain them. They just happened to you at the time you needed them. Uh, agreed. I Agreed. Yes. Yeah. But they always seem to involve food. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. So, I, I, so I'm glad you you have no regrets about what you did and how you did it. And I totally understand how you would change things. I think the accessibility of the trail is really partly to do, I uh, agree with you, to do with the how much easier it is to carry that whole weight, you know, your life on your back than it was literally 20 years ago. How, how much did your pack weigh when you started? With water, with water, so I had two quarts of water, five days of food, pack weight, everything included, hanging on the hook at Amicola Falls, I yeah. believe it weighed 62 pounds. <laughs> so by, by the time I got the Neal's Gap, um, I, I, I removed about four pounds of items that I, I'm like, ah, I could do without this. Um, <laughs> but still, I was still humming about, you know, 50, Six pounds wow. with water. So I always throw the water weight in there so it's true weight. It's actually what you're carrying. Um, yeah. But when I got to Katahdin, my pack, I had whittled it down to about 42 pounds with wow. water. That's still and substantial. Food. I started at 42 pounds. And I, when I came home after, uh, I think, three months, uh, I had to come home for a week, uh, I lost seven pounds of weight out of my pack, stuff I just hadn't wow. used or didn't eat, seven pounds of stuff. So you know you can wow. really get it get it down quicker and quicker. And, and if I were ever to to do this again, I think I would r literally look at everything I've got and try to take only the things I needed because there were several things after that three weeks. That's right, that three months on the trail that when I came home, I had never used them at all. And you know you think to yourself, you've been carrying that for the last seven hundred miles. It was ridiculous. So you know I, I think it's a. Uh, uh, I, I think looking back. Uh, on how you would have done things differently. I'm sure as you've carried on hiking as well uh, yeah. and since that time, you do go, you, you've you've changed your, the way in which you hike anyway, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the lighter the pack, the more enjoyable the journey is is the mantra. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we hike as a family continually. And so we, we have the latest and greatest gear. It, my whole family is outfitted for, you know, hiking and 
Um, so my son and, and I just did a, a spring backpack trip in the Smoky Mountains, just like I did when I was a young boy. And yeah. um, and but he but it's funny because my kids now have the best there is because <laughs> I'm into the lifestyle of hiking. Whereas when I was a kid, it, my parents weren't as savvy and they were still, you know, in the cotton clad model of, you know, car camping. So <laughs> us kids would just build our own equipment, you know, and it was rudimentary it would have been trash can liners and two liter, empty two liter pop bottles for your water. <laughs> so we, you know, but it was that passion to go. And that's why we, this, I grew up, I'm, I'm a seventies, eight, I graduated high school in 85. And, yeah. you know, so mm. we, we just love to get out there. So, you know, now you're like, gosh, we did some things you probably wouldn't do now, but back then things were just different. So, yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, and they're not necessarily better or nor worse. They are, you know, however heavy or light the gear is, everybody walked a different trail, don't they? That, you know, your trail was different in length. It was different in Hills. Um, it's still an amazing achievement whenever you've done this with whatever gear you take. Agreed. You know, it's funny. I, I, to this day, I still lecture continually about the Appalachian Trail. And yeah. and one question that's always asked at almost every talk is, what is your favorite place to go see the view? And, and, and what is the best view in each state? Is it, you know, and what I say back is, well, what I tell you will be different than what the next hiker will tell you, because it's all yeah. based on weather and how you felt at the time. Where Absolutely. if it was raining at, at that same spot when somebody else saw it, and I'm saying it's beautiful, they would have said, "Well, I didn't see anything. It was raining." And or if you were really fatigued and or dehydrated or hungry, then your your main um, Maslow hierarchical needs haven't been met. So you're more focused on that than the view. So um, so I try to uh, dodge that question. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with that. I've said many a time, you take the views when you get them because they may not be there tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. And to this day, if I see you see the signs that that I'll tell you, um, view half mile off the trail, and I'm thinking, you know, well, you you as a through hiker, you have a view all day at some point. That's so right. That's right. That, yeah. I avoided yeah. those like the plague. Actually, anything more than a half mile, I wasn't going there. <laughs> tell exactly. you. There, there are there are enough miles to walk on the real trail than that, that, that to go to a, a, a view half mile off it. <laughs> anyway, well, look, thanks Agreed. for catching up, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, uh, sure, Steve. And hopefully we'll talk again one day soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Bye. He had no buyer's remorse about his first hike. How true is that? Your hike is the sum of its parts. The good, the bad, the really bad, and the extraordinary. I love that affirmation. And what about his 62-pound pack? Oh, my God. I can't even get a hernia just thinking about that. So now, remembering that we'll be starting the Camino next week, Here is the last chapter of my book, Hiking the Appalachian Trail is Easy, especially if you've never hiked before. This time, I talk about success. I'll see you next week. Chapter 9. Success When I started this short book, I wanted to try and give you as much solid advice as I could to encourage you to consider getting out into the woods. There are pitfalls to consider, but they can all be overcome by application to the task at hand. Every day you will face challenges of one sort or another, but none that you won't be able to handle. One thing that you might want to consider, however, is that all your preconceived ideas regarding the AT will soon dissolve. I was wrong about absolutely everything. Whatever I had imagined was undermined, yet surpassed, by the actual experience of being in the woods. I was given a sharp reminder that standing on the sidelines of life is just wishing your time away. It was only by exposing myself to the rigours of this hike that I was able to form any real opinion of the AT. While I had no idea how physically tough it was going to be, my creaking 61-year-old body was able to adapt and cope. Your real challenge will be going on inside your head. How do you react when you've had a bad day? How do you cope with boring food? How do you get on when there's nobody around and you spend an entire day or even a few days alone? You'll have all these questions, and thousands of others, running around inside your head for days and weeks on end. Through hiking the Appalachian Trail needs to be the end, not the means to the end. Your hike has to be the one thing you want to do more than anything else over that extended period of time. If it isn't, if you start to second-guess yourself, you're going to lose the battle raging constantly in your brain. I'd assume that the wildlife would be threatening. It really wasn't. Virtually every animal that I saw 
apart from a pissed-off rattler and a couple of little slitherers, would rather have been anywhere else than near me. Bears held no fears for me once I'd seen a few. The dark of night, with little or no ambient light, was far less scary with others around. By the time I had to spend my first night in the woods without a soul in the vicinity, I was almost ready for the task. That night and other nights passed without any particularly disconcerting incidents. You will meet an extraordinary range of humanity. I'd presume that everybody would be like folks I met in my day-to-day encounters at home. That didn't turn out to be the case. There is something in the shared experience that bonds people to a cause greater than themselves. The mere fact that hikers commit to such a journey is normally an indication of a fierce determination. Once the early dropouts have fallen by the wayside, you'll be left with those who have really committed themselves to the task. Even the beauty of the place will be beyond your dreams. When I was in Tennessee, I wrote a blog post apologising for the use of the same superlatives all the time. My editor had similar reservations when she first took on the task of shaking my book into a more readable manuscript. The problem was that the superlatives were all fully deserved. Every day, I saw more beautiful vistas than most people see in a lifetime. Why wouldn't I express myself in that way? In short, shut your eyes and think about what you imagine the trail will be. Keep them closed and then multiply that feeling by at least 10, but more likely 50 times. That is what it will be like. There will be days when you find yourself feeling totally pissed off and pretty much done. I had quite a few of these days, yet was often reminded of the maxim, quoted to me early in my hike, that it was imperative not to quit on a bad day. This hiker law was sufficient to conquer a majority of my dark thoughts. I always rallied the following morning or the day after. I often found myself reflecting another oft-quoted adage, the trail provides. When I really needed some respite or when I was at the end of my tether, an incident, a kindness or a conversation would pull me out of my funk. In this notable example, it was a piece of paper. I had been hiking poorly one day in New York. The rocks were slimy terribly, and considering that my pace was fairly glacial most of the time, that was something of an achievement. I had days like that. The rocks certainly weren't any worse than usual. It was my reaction to them that contributed to my bad day. I really had enough, so I booked a motel to wallow in my own misery in a modicum of comfort. While the motel wasn't exactly the Ritz, it had the undoubted benefit of a nearby Chinese restaurant. Returning to my room with copious amounts of calories, I settled down to continue my moping. Ten minutes later, stuffed and immobile, I slumped back in my chair. My eye caught the light from a cellophane wrapper. I was encouraged to investigate further. Looking behind the discarded aluminum trays, I spotted some fortune cookies. I tend to lose all rational thought with regard to fortune cookies. If somebody's going to take the trouble to wrap some words of wisdom in a sweet snack, then I can take similar trouble choosing the words of wisdom that apply to me. There were five of them, and I only ever open one. This was an important moment in my current state of mind. My choice would give me something on which to hang my hat for at least the next couple of days. A wrong choice, and I'd be thrust further into a sulk from which there may have been no return. I shook my head slowly from side to side, as if weighing the ponderous nature of this choice. The longer I deliberated, the more onerous the choice became. I'm left-handed, so I considered the one on the left. No, too obvious. The one on the right? Too opposite. In the end, I thrust my hand forward and took the first one I touched. I was starting to wish I hadn't made too big a deal of this and slowly opened my future. It was perfect. The hands that had packed this cookie several months before had no idea that I'd need to see its message in another country and definitely at the right time. The photo that I took is a constant reminder to me that the Appalachian Trail is not to be taken lightly. It does, however, need to be taken for what it is. A bloody long walk during which you'll have some good days and you'll have some bad days. Whatever your day is, you really need to keep on keeping on. That will get you across the finish line. When you get to the weathered brown sign at the top of Katahdin, pause for a moment to take in the enormity of your efforts. Think about those who helped you from home. Think about everybody who supported you in their thoughts and prayers and even on social media. Think about your sisters and brothers on the trail. That last group will be the only one that will understand what you are going through on your return. That group alone will know the true importance of drinking water when you come across it and eating food as if you're facing the electric chair whenever you can. Everybody else will try to listen to what you're saying, but they will never hear what you're saying. 
I don't think it's too much to say that you will have joined an elite band of folks who have done far more than just gone for a long walk. I know that there were several of my fellow hikers for whom this was a spiritual experience. Even finishing at the top of Katahdin felt somehow closer to God for several of them. While I didn't share their revelation, I certainly saw the fervour within them and I respected it. Whatever you gain from your hike, share it with others. Let them know the liberation of living with little, eating without restraint, speaking with others, getting into the best physical shape of your life and facing up to your demons. I will never be who I was before the Appalachian Trail. I hope I've become a better version of myself.